Good evening. Hope you're all doing well tonight. We're going to go ahead and get started, so thank you all for joining us here. I'm Melanie Korn, president of Columbus College of Art and Design. Welcome to Cartoon Crossroads Columbus keynote event in conjunction with CCAD, a queer band book roundtable. This also serves as the second event in CCAD's Fall Visiting Artists and Scholars Lecture Series, featuring innovative artists, designers, and thinkers. The CCAD community is thrilled to host artists and authors, Maya Kobabe, Trung Lee Nguyen, and Mari Naomi, along with our moderator for the evening, comic scholar, Dr. Rachel Miller, for a very important conversation about banned books. I'd like to thank CCAD Comics and Narrative Practice Chair, Lauren McCubbin, who not only organized the special event, but has played an integral role in organizing CXC over the years, helping to provide an international showcase for cartoon art here in Columbus. CXC has been hosting comics, legends, and innovators since the very start, and I'm delighted that CCAD has been part of CXC from the beginning. Our faculty, students, and alumni have played important parts in CXC since the festival's inception, and this year is no exception. CCAD family members were involved in planning the event, spearheading programming, and tabling at the expo. I'd also like to extend our sincere thanks to CXC's executive director, J.B. Kalagayan, and all of those who help make the festival a success. I know that many of you here tonight are familiar with CCAD, but for those of you who aren't, allow me to tell you a little bit about us. CCAD is one of the oldest private nonprofit art and design colleges in the United States. We were founded by five women in 1879 and now have about 1,000 students. Our students are across 11 different BFA programs and two master's degree in a variety of visual art and design areas. And our mission is really quite similar to CXC's to foster a diverse community that educates students so they can unleash their creative power to shape culture and commerce. Specifically, graduates from our comics and narrative practice program go on to work as independent artists, writers, publishers, comics illustrators, colorists, letterers, storyboard artists, and character developers for comics, animation, gaming, and toys. Of course, our, sto our, our scope here at CCAD goes beyond comics and even beyond degree-seeking students. Our Saturday morning art classes that we have been teaching for over 100 years help school-aged children and teens grow a love for art and design. And more recently, we've expanded our array of classes for, for adults to include courses that allow them to explore their creative skills, as well as courses that help them enhance their resumes for the creative economy and workplace. And that's not all. As I mentioned, our Visiting Artists and Scholars series features innovative artists, designers, and thinkers whose talks are always free and open to the public. And so I'd encourage you to join us back here on Thursday, November 10th, as we welcome author Saeed Jones for a discussion about his memoir, How We Fight for Our Lives, which is the college's first year common read for this year, 20, the 2022-2023 school year. Jones's coming-of-age memoir is about a young, black, gay man from the South fighting to carve out a place for himself within his family and within his country. Finally, as you joined us tonight, you passed by our Beeler Gallery, which hosts a, a, quite an array of contemporary and experimental art and design exhibitions. In fact, a brand new show, 1,000 Miles Per Hour, a lens-based exhibition showcasing the power of space and perspective, just opened recently. Admission is always free and open to the public, so I would encourage you to come back and visit the gallery on your next way through. Okay, I know that's a lot to take in. Uh, you can always be reminded of all these things I shared with you and see much more um, about events and other things happening at CCAD's calendar, www.ccad.edu slash calendar. And now, let's turn our attention to this evening. I won't try to summarize the extensive bios of our esteemed panelists. Better that you hear about their impressive work directly from them in just a moment. But the topic that they will be discussing is both important and urgent in a way that few conversation topics truly are today. Over the past year, an unprecedented number of books, nearly 1,145 in all, have been the target of bans in schools, libraries, bookshops, across the United States, and unfortunately, 
right here in Columbus. And with their ability to tell stories with both text and image, comics and graphic novels are right at the center of this controversy. With bans against graphic memoirs, such as Art Spiegelman's Mouse and Maya Kobabe's Genderqueer making national headlines. Often, books that tell stories about queerness, race, gender, and history are the target of bans, as is the case for Trung Lee Nguyen's The Magic Fish and Mari Naomi's Life on Earth series. As Kobabe has pointed out, book banning often hurts the very groups who are the subjects of these works. And if I may be so bold, I do not see this as accidental. Knowledge is power, and those who ban books purposely monger fear and peddle ignorance because they understand that power. So tonight, I am especially looking forward to gaining new knowledge from a conversation which will examine the impact of book banning and why comics are at the center of that discussion. Our panel will address cultivating creativity and community through comics during this divisive moment in our history. Please help me welcome Maya Tr uh, Trung, Mari Naomi, and Dr. Rachel Miller to the stage. Thank you, Dr. Korn, um, for that introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Awesome. Um, and thank you all for being here, for CCAD, for hosting us, and CXC. Um, super excited to be here with Mari, Maya, and Trung uh, to have this discussion. So um, thank you to you all as well. Let's give them another round of applause. <laughs> I was really um, excited to have this conversation with you all because um, I feel like comics are really at the center of this discussion about book banning um, and queer comics in particular. Um, I grew up, my mom was a public school librarian and she was also a public school, uh, she worked in public schools as the librarian and worked at public libraries. So she kind of had a lot of experience with these types of challenges, um, and I remember that pretty clearly. Uh, the rule in our house was always, you can read whatever you want, <laughs> um, and I really appreciated that. So, um, But I wanted to kind of kick off this discussion by asking you all what your first memories or experiences with book banning or book challenges were. I feel like mine is a really positive experience, which was I'm from the Bay Area, California, a very liberal area of this country, and the librarians would, of course, celebrate Banned Book Week, which we just had at the end of September, and they would celebrate it with like displays and usually make like a, a bookmark or some sort of pamphlet that listed, you know, commonly banned books. If anyone knows me, I love a list. And so <laughs> I would usually take this list or bookmark and be like, how many can I read in one month? Um, I'm also a very voracious reader. I try to read 100 books a year, so like for me being like, yeah, maybe I can get 15 this month. Um, so I feel like for me, it was like, I, I don't know that I was ever in a school or community which was actually banning a book. I was just in the communities that were like trying to raise awareness about books that were being challenged elsewhere. And I was usually seeing it as like, cool, a list of books that are probably excellent. Thank you. <laughs> so, this is my new reading list. This is my new reading list. Precisely, yeah. Mario. I mean, I feel like when I was young and I heard about banned books, I of course wanted to read them all because, <laughs> you know, you want to do all the things that you're not supposed to do, the forbidden fruit. I don't, like, my parents didn't really at all restrict me from books. Like, they tried to protect me from cartoons they thought would be scary, um, like Scooby-Doo or I'm something. Terrifying. I know, <laughs> right? Terrifying. Yeah, I would, but then I was, yeah, like, exposed, like, we went to some Japanese movie and they had, like, a terrifying uh, preview of another movie that was about Lockjaw, and so for, like, half my life I was terrified of Lockjaw. <laughs> yes. So, but, yeah, I was, I was never restricted. Um, there was, in, when I was 11, I was given, well, I went through a bunch of books um, that my sixth grade teacher had 
out and I found Kurt Vonnegut's slapstick, which was about incest and, you know, the end of the world. And of course, I'm like, oh, what's this pretty clown on it? And he's like, I don't know if that's age appropriate. And of course, that made me want to read it. And that was actually the book that made me fall in love with books because I had never been exposed to satire before. I'm like, oh my gosh, someone else out there is like me. Um, but yeah, aside from, from that, like very minimal until I was an adult. Mm. and got banned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't say that I had much interaction intentionally with the notion of banned books until I became an adult, um, which to my mind, I'm like, oh, that's kind of lucky because I grew up with um, you know, parents without the same level of literacy and the same language as me. And so they couldn't police what I read <laughs> because they just didn't read the same things. Right. Um, but now that I think about it a little bit more, I was parochially educated. And so there were a lot of very specific kinds of literature that were revealed to me at my school's libraries. And the librarians generally did a very good job of making sure that we had access to a lot of different kinds of books. Um, but there was definitely a dearth of books that discussed sexuality, of course, or that discussed um, race in a way that was meaningfully conscientious outside of very, or they wouldn't, wouldn't be stocked very well. And it's not something that I would have noticed because I was a kid and I'm realizing now that that's the experience that kids who encounter banned books or have their bo have books banned in their public libraries will have. They will just not have access mm -hmm. and they won't notice it until they're much older and they have to catch up and they have to discern that they've been missing something. Right. Yeah, I, it's so interesting that you raised that point because much like Maya, uh, I think when I, when a book was challenged in my school system or like I, something was you know, banned, that made me want to read it more. But banning now kind of seems more so like erasure in terms of access, right? So, yeah. Um, so, I kind of intended this panel to be not just a discussion about book banning, but also a celebration of queer comics. So that's kind of like my plan for our conversation, <laughs> um, is to not just focus on the bans or trying to solve book banning, which I don't know if any of us can do. <sighs> um, <laughs> but I am interested in hearing from all of you what your experience was like having your book banned and what kind of feelings that brought up for you. Um, I'll go yeah. first. Um, yeah. I was, uh, you know, for many, many years, I all, you know, it was always a joke, like, oh, I, I wish they just banned my books so they'd sell. <laughs> that was always the joke. And um, when it eventually happened pretty recently, I did not feel the, the feelings that I thought I would feel. I thought it would be like, yay, you know, my sales would, would increase, which they did. I mean, that's, of course, what happened. Um, in fact, thing, books that I had that had gone, um, what do you call it? Out of print. Out of print or... were suddenly back in print because um, <laughs> banning does the exact opposite in that way. But really what I was feeling was this Kind of, I mean, I found out through the LA Times um, when a friend of mine's boyfriend saw my name in it and was like, oh, did Mari know that her book was banned? And I'm like, uh, no, I did not. Tell me more. <laughs> in Katy, Texas, and I'm from Texas, and I was like, I felt really betrayed. Mm. You know, even though I don't really have a connection to Texas anymore, I'm like, wait, that's where I'm from. And, and it was just confusing because they were banning it because of queer content, but the book, the specific book that they banned, even though I, I write lots of queer content, that specific book did not have queer content. Mm. So I'm like, okay, so they just didn't like that I'm queer is what I'm mm. thinking. Or they just assume that there's queer content. Um, I mean, there's plenty of objectable, objectionable content in it, I'm sure, for some people. Um, but I don't think they read it, first of all. Um, so really, I felt like I was being banned because of who I was and who I can't help but being. And um, I was just really offended. My feelings were really hurt. And, I, and even though more people were suddenly buying the book, it just it struck me that the wrong people would be reading my book now. Um, mm. Because I feel like the kids who wouldn't have access to the book who would need to see, you know, hopefully, you know, would want to see themselves reflected in the book. I mean, there's not. There's not a lot of bisexuality in kids, like in young adult books. There's not a lot of mixed race 
kids in young adult books. I mean, there, it, there's more and more, but there's just not a lot yet. Right. And I feel like those are the people um, who really need to see a book like mine um, and who have, I, I hear from their parents, like, wow, my daughter has read your book like 10 times. She's just so excited to see a half Japanese girl and a you know, protagonist. Like, those are the people who need to see it. But the people who are buying it are people who have access to books, who can just go on Amazon and buy it or whatever. And like, you know, and I'm happy. I'm, I'm you know, I'm super happy for the money. Thank you, Texas. <laughs> but like, I, what I really want is for some kid who's like going through a hard time to be able to go into the school library and pick up the book and see that other people might have gone through what they're going through and not feel so alone. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's who I really want to see it. Um, so yeah, I got. I wasn't flattered at all. I was angry. Yeah. And hurt. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's unfortunate that, like, when a book is banned, the readers who are most impacted are the readers who are already the most marginalized. It's people who cannot afford to buy books and only read books in the library. And then, specifically in the case of queer books, young people who might not be comfortable bringing an obviously queer book back to a perhaps an unsupportive home and only could read it in the library, maybe without even checking it out. And that's the type of reader who's most impacted by specifically by removals from public libraries. And so, yes, I too have seen an increase in sales, but I'm like, it's probably mostly people who are a little bit older, either older teens, adults, the type of people who are listening to NPR, who are reading the New York Times. And like, I'm very happy for those readers also, but it's not the youngest and like the lowest income and the sort of most precarious readers. It's like, those are the readers who are, whose access is being the most limited. And that, to me, is the part that hurts the most because, like, I think I'm like pretty good at like letting a lot of stuff wash off my back. I'm I do not read comments. I'm very good at not reading comments. I'm very good at blocking and deleting and moving on. Um, so, like, I'd say personally, the way that it's mostly affected is by just wasting a lot of my time. Um, but like, the part that hurts for me is being like, ah, yeah, there's like that reader who might need the most and who also doesn't know to look for it, who could only who might stumble across it while browsing that is the reader who will not maybe have it if it is banned and actually removed. Yeah, yeah I also find out, found out about getting banned like through the news or through friends. Like it's never, like your publisher won't let you know. And like, <laughs> like the, you know, you don't find out through official channels. You just yeah, you happen to- Yeah, you get tagged to... on social media. Exactly, yeah. yeah, you get tagged. Like somebody yeah. is like, hey, did you know that your book is banned? I was like, great, thanks for the news. Um, <laughs> but I mean, as an, like, as an adult and like as an author, I find that the, like I'm not, I haven't looked into the sales numbers. I don't, I feel very, weird about feeling okay about sales going up at all because I know that that's not the case for every band yeah. book author like we all have books that gain a little bit of traction that have a lot of like we all have books that are taught that have yeah. stewards in the library system and have stewards um, in terms of the school systems and so we have people who are advocating for us so they notice when our books are gone yeah but for debut authors or yeah, for like, authors like from mid-range authors yeah. some books that are banned and there's no media attention, yeah. it can actually really negatively impact yes. the book's success. Or if then booksellers are like worried to carry it or, or librarians mm -hmm. are worried to buy it because they think a challenge might happen in the future. Mm -hmm. And then they actually just don't even buy it in the first place, which is like yes. self-censorship, soft, quiet, mm -hmm. then silent censorship. I mean, yeah, and that's how it mostly happens. Yeah. It happens quietly. They yeah. get on shelves. The orders yeah. get canceled. Nobody hears about them or in the first place. Or it gets moved like just further back. Like mm -hmm. it's not facing out anymore. It's on the spine or it's on a further mm -hmm. back shelf, that kind of thing. And yeah, and when, I think all of us have had enough media attention that that's not happen hitting us. And that's also why we're on this stage today. Mm -hmm. But like the authors who are actually hitting, like it's impacting them more negatively, we don't know their names. Yes, yeah, and it impacts their, the longevity of their careers yeah. as well in the most immediate way because if they don't make those sales back as debut authors, as mid-listers, they don't get to move up and then yeah. publishers are less inclined to work with them in the future because they look at their numbers and they're like, oh, we didn't recoup our costs on printing this, you're never gonna get royalties back and so you're just not going to be a good investment for us anymore and so it does impact the, like the mid-listers the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of um, making me think about, you know, Mari and I were talking about earlier the creative process and my anxiety about, you know, write, writing my story or any anything like that. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, have these challenges affected all of your creative processes or, um, 
have they do they factor in at all when you kind of like sit at the drawing table or like sit to write sit down to write um do they cross your mind at all i can tell you that they won't because it won't matter mm. um and i am saying that as someone whose book is like my book is ostensibly young adults but it has a pretty broad age appropriateness because i don't t my work um the magic fish there's no course language, like the difficult conversations tend to be stewarded by parents and authority figures. And I come from a fairly conservative background and continue to have fairly conservative affectations. None of those things will matter. It's your identity that matters. They will zero in on those things. The magic fish has cannibalism in it that never gets brought up. And it's always the queerness that's the thing that gets people's attention. So, so, it, does, it, it, so it doesn't really matter the way in which you approach it. It can be for any audience as long as it's queer, as long as it's about race, as long as it's about identity in any which way, they're going to find it. Mm. Yeah. I'm very grateful that I'd already written 90% of my second book before like all the media attention started yeah. like in fall of last year. So I'd say my next book is pretty much completely untouched by all of this situation. Um, I, it's definitely not going to stop me from writing like queer stories. I'm probably going to write even queerer stories. Than <laughs> any, but like, I, I have a feeling I will write just about this experience of banning at some point, but like for me, it still feels so, um, it's still so ongoing that I can't feel like I can even talk about what it is, is or has been because it's like, I'm still like, I'm still in the middle of it. Mm. So I can't really like reflect on it yet. So like, I'm, I think I will make work about this experience, but like, who knows? I don't know. Several more years down the line, probably. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. I'm, I, I don't think it's affected me at all. I was like, how's it? Well, I don't really do young adult. I'm like, oh, wait, I just wrote that middle grade <laughs> script that Chung's going to illustrate. <laughs> and it didn't cross my, my mind even in a sec, like for a second. Like, no, I just, because uh, when I'm in the creative mode, I'm not thinking about other people. I'm thinking about the story. Yeah. Yeah. Thank that, goodness. <laughs> yeah. I know a lot of people like really get in their heads. I mean, I've been doing this since the 90s, so I feel like it's really easy for me to just shut the world out. Yeah, yeah kind of put the blinders on. Yeah. And again, I think you brought up earlier like this idea that what they're attacking is not the stories. They're not even really mm -hmm. reading the books themselves, you know? Yeah. So I think it is that we exist is yeah. what the problem is mm -hmm. to them, which is I mean, that's so sad for them because what a limited world scope they have. But like, right. I mean, and we're really cool. Yeah. So. They don't get to hang out with us. No. <laughs> I think it's also important to mention that this conversation is happening in and around comics because yeah. comics for a long time was banned for its format because it was considered trash and it wasn't literary enough. Yeah. And there still remains a lot of plausible deniability about the impact of comics within a literary space. And now it's sort of like, oh, are you banning us because you think that we're trash and that we don't contribute anything? Or are you banning us because of these other things? Mm -hmm. And so we're either too ineffective to be considered <laughs> or we're too dangerous. Yeah. And it's just like, which is it, man? Yeah. Right, <laughs> comics are, have yes. always been polarizing since, you know, Seduction of the Innocents, exactly. 1940s, yes. comic book burnings, and I'm like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> like, yes. So, I um, think to comics, though, at the same time, I was doing um, video game writing, so I'm just used to being controversial. <laughs> like, everyone <laughs> thinks that we're, yeah, all or nothing, like, too important, not important enough. Yeah. Right. It's like, I am who I am. I'm showing up this way. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Um, Maya, you said that banning or challenging books is like a community attacking itself. Um, and I wonder if uh, you could talk a little bit more about what you mean by that. Yeah, I mean, any community that yeah pulls books or resources out of its own public sphere is just impoverishing itself. I mean, it's just, um, and it's it's like, it's it's weakening and impoverishing like sort of every level of the society and it's from people literally not being able to access books so they can't read them they can't you have scholarship around them etc and then also it's i think the people in the marginalized communities who are then seeing other people you know calling these narratives that they might relate to problematic dangerous inappropriate etc then in hope, like internalizing some of that like hurt and those negative messages mm -hmm. so it's like those are like the two ways that i see it happening and I really hope that specifically the queer young people of today are smart enough to like not listen to all of the, like, I guess like the conservative backlash of saying these books are yeah bad, dangerous, not appropriate for the classroom, et cetera, and are not taking any of that into them own into themselves. 
Um, but I fear that they are, and that that's like a it's going to impact well, them much been down the road. Shit about queers I, forever. I know. Like, and now we all have therapists. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like in the '80s it was coming from all sides, and now it's coming from a very select group of that's people. That's true. That's true. Which is kind of helpful because yeah. At least you can like know the demographic to ignore. Yeah, and yeah. and now there are more spa safe spaces that are actually legal to be in, which is you know things I, things are better in a lot of ways. Um, and in some ways they're getting worse, but I feel like they're going to get better too. Yeah. Yeah. I just think a community with more books is better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Um, and I do want to talk more about the books in depth. So I think we've got the, we've covered all the bases in terms of book banning. <laughs> so let's talk about and celebrate the books themselves. Um, Something that I noticed in all, all of these works, the Life on Earth series, The Magic Fish, Gender Queer, is kind of the importance of reading, first of all, but also being able to share literature between people, right? Um, sharing stories, sharing books, even sharing media as like this act of maybe tr helping to explain something, helping to um, communicate something, or just building community. So I'm interested in, you know, um, why did it feel so important to cite this process of discovering media, sharing books, sharing literature in, in, in these different works, in these different ways? Do you want to go first? I feel like fairy tales are so woven through. <laughs> sure, yeah. Books. No, we're all just shot through with fairy tales all of us. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think for me, and I think this actually dovetails actually really nicely into the band book conversation, and I don't mean to come back to it. And, and not that this conversation <laughs> oh, is over, but like, I'm, I've never been the sort of reader who needed to see myself in media, right? Mm -hmm. Queer people, people of color, we've enjoyed all kinds of media where we don't find ourselves necessarily, but we're able to empathize with the main characters. We're able to go along with other people on their journeys. And so we have this incredible experience of being able to exercise our empathy with all of these fictional characters all the time that exist outside of our kind of experience. And um, The Magic Fish, while I was writing it, I had to really interrogate that perspective for myself, because the story is necessarily about a child saying, I want you to still love me when I express this part of myself to you. Yeah. And I realized that queer stories aren't for queer people necessarily. Stories that we tell are for everyone. They, they're for people to be able to practice accessing their empathy. And when you take those books off the shelves, you're depriving young readers of opportunities to see their peers as people, mm -hmm. to access their compassion. And so it's it becomes this issue of you're diminishing this specific avenue by which your community can become stronger and be there for each other. Yeah. I've thought about that a lot about, I mean, all like pretty much all of my books are about compassion and just all of reading for me is about finding compassion or putting myself in other people's shoes. And this series specifically was literally about being put, seeing the eye, you know, the world through other people's eyes. Like each protagonist has a different perspective of what's going on behind me. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone's eyes are shifting up. What's going on? Um, yeah, no, and, and, it, and it totally makes sense. Like I, I one of the things I was twittering about when this was all happening was like, I'm like, oh really? So, you, so you're basically, all these bigots just want to make their children bigots too. Like, mm -hmm. wow, like you're so small minded. Like, I mean, I'm not a parent and I never plan on being one, um, never had that urge, but like I would think that I would want to pass on, um, and I do want to pass on to younger readers, more empathy. Like, I, like I'm always trying to be, or no, more compassion specifically, like I'm always, writing about compassion because I want to be more compassionate and I hope that the next generation could just keep being more compassionate and more, because I mean, how else are you going to get world peace? I mean, not to go there, but that's where we're going because I'm taking us there. Um, <laughs> and but like there, these people are like obstructing world peace the way I see it. They are like physically saying, no, you cannot empathize with people. You cannot have compassion. You cannot see the world through their eyes. 
I mean, it, oh, it makes me so angry. Oh, it's, it's bringing up baggage. All right, you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are a ton of pop culture references and references to books um, in Gender Do you have the page with the, the library? I'm trying to. Yeah, I, I saw it see. earlier when we were talking yes. to yeah, yeah, There we go. Oh. Um, I think for me, it was that I didn't have very many adult queer role models when I was a kid. I had a, I had a couple. Um, and when I was in high school, I was able to join a GSA, so I knew an out older gay student, an out older bisexual student, but I didn't meet an out trans or non-binary person until I was in grad school. Mm -hmm. And so that's like a long, many years to go without seeing anybody who's like kind of doing the same thing with gender as like you are. And I think I was so hungry for role models and for like examples of what my own future could look like. I was just like starving for these like queer stories. And I was a teenager in like the early 2000s and there was a lot less accessible then than there is now. But I like combed the library for like anything that was even like a scrap of queerness, a crumb of queerness <laughs> and would like just like devour it all. Um, and I was really, yeah, I was like looking for reflections of myself that I wasn't seeing so much in like the actual day-to-day -day world around me. Oops. And then, um, yeah, and just like, just trying to figure out like who, who am I and how do I want to relate to the world and how do I want to move through the world, including things like how do I want to dress? What kind of job could I have? Just like, what does an adult queer person look like? What do they do? I want to know, you know? So I think for me, that, that's part of like, that was just such a huge part of my young adulthood. So of course it had to be in the book. And again, that's like why I also was like, it's so important that the queer books are in the library so the queer kids can read them and the non-queer kids can read them. And also, you know, but both, like both of those. So, yeah. but yeah. I and feel like, oh, go ahead. I'm just like, one other interesting point is that when I was writing Gender Queer, at no point in the editorial process did anyone tell me that the topics of sexual health, sex ed, masturbation, menstrual blood, you know, pap smear exams, no one at any point suggested that I tone down any of those topics or that any of them might cause problems. The only thing that the legal review told me is that I had to cut some of the pop culture references because they were worried about being sued <laughs> because there was a seven page sequence in Genderqueer that we had to cut that was all about watching queer TV shows and movies. And I included the characters from all of these like classic like drag queen movies like Priscilla Queen of the Desert and Tu Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julia Newmar and Queer as Folk and like all of this. I had like literally a whole seven page scene about like queer TV oh, so that sad. they made me cut because they said we can't get the license to include these characters from TV and movies from this to be too hard, it would take too long to ask the studios for permission, blah, blah, blah. So literally the one thing that I had to cut was TV characters. <laughs> and then I drew, I had to draw a new scene very late in the editorial, like relate in the, the process to replace it. So like that's the only thing that editors like told me to change. Are you going to um, publish a mini comic with the yeah. cut scenes from Gender Queer? So <laughs> they are on my Patreon, okay. exclusive content. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't, it doesn't, it's a scene, I don't know. I don't know that the scene stands alone that well. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe. But anyway, I just thought that was interesting. That it was like literally like <laughs> they thought, oh, we're going to get sued over pop culture references. And that's not what they got sued over. <laughs> <laughs> I do love this image from Gender Queer of this book that's like just sparking with electricity because that's what, that's what it really felt like to encounter a book where, you know, you felt seen or you felt like, oh, this is what I've been searching for. This story is something where I'm not getting this in my day-to-day -day life, um, but here I can live in that world or, or be around people who are like me, right? Mm -hmm. So I just, I love that image um, of books sparking with electricity. <laughs> I would say that when I was um, figuring out my bisexuality, I also didn't have a lot of people in my life. Um, I had a couple. Um, actually, the gal who shows up in my next book that's coming out next February through Field Maps Press, she was um, she kind of kissed me out of the closet. Yeah. But like, there weren't a lot of like there certainly weren't a lot of older people. Like I knew older gay men, um, but I didn't really know lesbians, and that's what I was a little more interested in. And. Um, <laughs> So I was a little obsessed with reading about them. Um, Ruby Fruit Jungle was that electric spark out of a book. And I was a bit older. I was like in my late teens, early 20s. Um, so reading was really important um, for discovering that. Um, it's, it's funny, though, because like I, I didn't really know where I fit on that spectrum. 
Um, what I was actually more hungry for uh, was representation for people who looked like me, because like nobody did at the time that I knew of. I mean, I later found out that Phoebe Cates and Keanu Reeves and like Meg Tilly and, and Jennifer Tilly were half Asian, but like I didn't know that, and I I thought I was the oldest one. And oh. no, it was weird. And I would sit there as a kid, staring in the mirror, going, "What am I gonna look like when I'm old?" And I'd like kind of fold wrinkles into my face, like to try to figure it out, because like I knew nobody who looked like me, <laughs> who was older, it was, yeah. So there needs to be more of that too. And I do think it's worth saying that a lot of the books that are being banned also are about critical race theory yes. and have, um, right. and I can't, because I was told that the queer, you know, the LA Times said that queer content was why my book was banned, but like there's an abortion in it. Mm. And there's also an interracial relationship. Yeah. And um, when I had a sensitivity reader go through it, he was like, yeah, I think, I think your biggest problem is like the kiss between the black guy and the Asian girl. I'm like, wow. we'll see. And so maybe that yeah. was the real reason. I don't know. That's, it's, I'm glad you bring that up, because like the, the list of like the most challenged books from 2021, genderqueer was number one, but very high on the list was All Boys Aren't Blue by uh, George M. Johnson, mm -hmm. who is non-binary and black and queer, so very mm -hmm. intersectional, and another one um, is Ashley Hope Perez's book, Out of Darkness, which includes, uh, yeah, it's set in the 1930s, so there's like uh, anti-black and anti-Mexican racism and also an interracial relationship and themes of sexual abuse. And so like, yeah, it's all of these, these are like the, the themes that nobody nobody wants. Michelle Obama's yeah. book, memoir was banned because they said it was reverse racism. <laughs> I can't even say that word. <laughs> 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 you can get the phrase out. Yeah, 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 and then it is. Uh, yeah, and <laughs> anyway, yes, and it, I, there was the uh, for what for a minute, and I think both of I think all of our books appears on that the Matt Krause list and uh -huh. the Texas uh -huh. list that had like eight hundred and fifty books on it, <laughs> and Book Riot did a really good breakdown of like what all of the categories were, and yeah, it was like queerness, um, the history of race in America. Um, anti-racism, critical race theory, but then, yeah, abortion, sex ed, and then also civil rights and students' rights were like the topics that were the most represented and banned on that list. And that list... Oh, Derek Factor, yeah, his Kent State was banned, which yeah. is weird. Like, yeah, I don't like books that. literally about like history. the history, but also specifically like students' rights to protest and privacy mm -hmm. and like that kind of stuff. And like, again, it's like, what do they not want the young people to be able to know their own rights? Right. Yeah, so. Oh, yes. so oh, evil. Yeah. <laughs> it's maddening. And it's yeah. like, it kind of seems like these, um, you know, writing about being biracial or being bisexual or living at any kind of intersection that we don't see represented like in ma the mainstream media. Um, it's, people have di a difficulty engaging with that. Um, like these people who are challenging these books. Maybe um, they should read the books. Maybe they should maybe read, they the, books, should read right? the books, right? <laughs> um, I did want to talk about, so, um, comics obviously are like an image-based medium, we know this, um, but Mari, I was really struck by, in your books, how much you chose not to show. There are these scenes where, that are, you know, um, several different moments. This one is a first time sexual encounter, for example, but where the page just goes completely dark. This was right? my editor. Um, he, it originally showed some um, knees and elbows. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very provocative stuff. Yeah, there, it was supposed to be like all knees and elbows, um, but he cut it out because he didn't want the book to be banned. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that was the choice for that page. <laughs> And I was kind of noticing that this happens in in all of your your books. Uh, you were talking about, you know, the magic fish has cannibalism, but no one talks about that. Mm -hmm. um, and there are these scenes that, you know, um, I'm trying to see. Oh, here's some more blacked out pages from Mari's book. Uh, well, that was my choice because I, I really didn't want to have to draw that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, and I just like that page, but. And so there are these like moments that are, there's a balance or interplay in these books between what is shown and what is not shown. And I actually think you all do a really good job of not um, kind of exploiting the image or making something that's like trying to be so provocative that it's difficult to read. So I was just wondering if you could talk about that process of choosing what to show, choosing what to put into image um, in, your, in your books. 
Sure. I mean, I think for all of us, we're, we're authors, we're writers, we're storytellers. And so if it doesn't st serve the story, if it doesn't serve the reader, mm. then it's not important to include that. Like, I think we get caught into this trap of, you know, that the thing that we do is an art and art should be personal and indulgent. And I think in many ways it should be. But at the same time, at the end of the day, especially with our books, we go through an editorial process where, you know, we write long books. We, we are intentional about the narrative arcs. So if it doesn't serve the narrative, and if it doesn't serve the reader, even if it serves our personal interests and inclinations, that's not the priority in the book. And so for me, at least, I'm thinking about the reader, what it is that they need to move the story forward. If it's not pertinent to their experience, then I just don't include it. Yeah. I don't want to be gratuitous. Like, mm. I mean, you can't control what a reader is going to get out of a story. And if they're going to sexualize a rape scene, then they're going to sexualize a rape scene. But I try to keep it from happening as best as I can. Like, uh, you know, if I don't want to make it sexy, if it's not intended to be sexy. But some people find, like, feet sexy. I mean, no, and, and no shame if you do. Like, totally cool. But, like, it's just not my thing. But, like, I, yeah, I just. Yeah, this I would consider this like the probably the most intense and explicit spread from my book. And this is never the spread that's mentioned in challenges. <laughs> Nobody goes, we're banning it because it talks about pap smears and it sounds kind of traumatic. You know, it's always about the, the like usually the inclusion of a sex toy is usually more more brought up than this. And it's just it's that is another one where I'm like, I'm pretty sure most of the people banning my book haven't actually read it. <laughs> right. um, and it's not even very long. It takes like one hour. It's, there's so few words, honestly. Uh, anyway, um, it's true. I've but read yeah, it there's one times. <laughs> there's one panel in my book that is black. I don't know if you have it in another slide. It's from the second Paps and exam scene in the book. And there's one panel that I just blacked it out and wrote text in it. And again, it was kind of like. I was sort of like, this scene does enough. I don't really need to do it again. And right. it was also like, that also, I don't want to draw this. Mm -hmm. And then also just kind of like, I think by that point I had earned like a, a text panel because like, it's um, it's at least like 200 pages into the book. And I was like, I think I can get away with at least one thing that I don't draw. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But again, it's it's thinking about the story. What does the story need? What does the, yes. what does the narrative need? Um, what does the reader need to, what do I need to say and show to make sure the reader understands what I am trying to say and show? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're just doing the best we can. We're just doing the best we can. <laughs> doing the best I can with my pencils and my inks. <laughs> it takes so long to draw. Why? <laughs> um, I do want to talk a little bit about um, kind of fantasy mm. and queerness. Mm. I think in the you know, before the 21st century, there was all the, there's all this media that where queerness is kind of encoded into fantasy. Um, but I'm noticing more so now that, especially with your book, Trung, the queerness is overt and it's on the surface. Um, so I'm just interested in that in that integration of you know, fantasy into this storyline. Um, sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, especially with The Magic Fish, it's not a fantasy book. Um, I tend to make pretty strong distinctions between, you know, like fantasy and fairy tales. They occupy different kind of cultural spaces and they have different roles within like the cultural imagination. And the great thing about kind of having fantastical elements is that you can talk about really kind of fraught things, that, uh, kind of esoteric things for which you don't have the language for. Um, and you can address those things in a way that can access another person's empathy. Um, and so I really love that that can be something that fantasy and fairy tales can do. I like fairy tales specifically because there are so many different iterations of the same fairy tale from place to place and from time to time that it becomes really evident that it is stripped down to its core. Storytelling is a community activity. The stories are maybe not the most important part of storytelling. It's the storyteller and it's the person who hears the story. It's priorities being shared. You learn about what people care about. You learn about the things that make them happy, the things that frighten them, the things that, the things that scare them. And so it doesn't matter if the same story is told over and over and over if the storyteller is different. And so all of the fairy tales that I included in The Magic Fish were sort of used to the effect of how do we get these stories um, to be told from these different perspectives, from these visual imaginations that are very distinct from one another um, in a way that can convey that the characters are trying to connect with each other and be very
very specific while also being very broad at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So I think you can kind of like take, well, in the past, you know, I feel like I've taken a story and I've projected things onto that story that might, might not have been there, but it was meaningful to me at the time. And so I love this exchange that happens in The Magic Fish between um, the, the mother and her son kind of sharing these stories, right? And I think you're right, it's like that, that act of coming together to talk through something without talking about it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, Such a beautiful book. Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and even, um, let's see, a couple. Mm. There are other moments where kind of fantasy plays that role in, in your work, Maya. Um, where fantasy is actually like instructional, reading a fantasy <laughs> book, like you're learning about the world, right? Yeah. So. Uh, this is from the uh, the book Alana, the First Adventure by an author named Tamora Pierce. It's the first book I ever read that like talked about periods in a really detailed way, I guess, and included like some good advice, which is like, like, like shower every day, you know, like, you know, it's like really <laughs> basic stuff. Um, but yeah, it's a fantasy novel that includes a talking cats and like gods and goddesses and magic and dragons and all of this. And I think, um, I mean, I just love, I love magic and fairy tales and fantasy all as a genre, but I think especially as a young person who felt pretty out of, out of step and out of place with a lot of my peers, I didn't want to read books that were set in our our contemporary world. I really only wanted to read books that had some sort of fantasy element because I wanted that sort of escape into like a different, more marvelous world yeah. for a while. But then it's interesting that that it was one of these fantasy books that then kind of like brought back around to this like also really like grounded like body knowledge too. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. You know? It's. What was your experience with broader fantasy books too? Because I'm always interested in queer creators' relationships to fantasy, like, as a genre, mm. because nowadays, like, we're, we're seeing a lot of fantasy show up, you know, on our television screens, and there are all kinds of controversies about, like, oh, <laughs> the casting is such and such, and you're like, it's a fantasy, they're talking dragons or whatever, why can't they yeah. be dragons? <laughs> yeah, you mean specifically people saying, like, why are there black people in my yeah. story about dragons? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes that and, like, how thing. is there queerness in this now? Yeah, and then you, yeah that's but, not historically accurate to what? <laughs> to Middle Earth? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I do think I, I loved, I absolutely loved things. Like as a teenager, I like wouldn't pick up a book unless it had like a dragon, an elf, a sword, Same. a wizard, or a castle on the cover. Uh -huh. um, and, but looking back, almost all of those books were by white authors and almost all of them were by men and the majority of the main characters were white male main characters and like what you said like i there were so many of them that i enjoyed without relating to the characters at all i it's interesting like thinking back what's the first time i actually read a character that I related to, like very few. I would be like, I like the character, but I don't relate to them at all, yeah. you know, including like many series, but um, I still do, I still do love it. And I think, I don't know, I think part of it is just like the exercise, the, the imagination and seeing something mm -hmm. beyond what is in your day-to-day -day life. And yeah. when you feel like you, you are searching for things that are not in your day-to-day -day life, fantasy can feel really comforting, mm -hmm. honestly. Yeah. And I think people have sentimentalized fantasy as, a, as an escape all of the time. And it's yeah. so heartbreaking to be like a queer or a brown person who loved fantasy as a small child. And then you love that notion of escape and then you get older and then you realize, oh, people are escaping to a place where you don't exist. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but there's like more and more really good <laughs> queer and queer um, fantasy and sci-fi now with like with queer and POC leads and like yeah. I honestly also I've found in the last five years I've read almost exclusively books that have been published in the last five years and like there are a lot of like fantasy authors that I maybe read pretty extensively as a teenager that I'm just like very uninterested in returning to because I'm like we have better now and yeah. like it's not to say that i don't want people to read them and enjoy them but i'm like i want to read like these new books that are coming out like i'm very obsessed with uh, a queer vietnamese american author named ni vo who's been putting out oh, yes. several books with like the either non-binary stuff yeah oh, okay so just oh, i love all of them so mm -hmm. nine non-binary main characters yeah queer main characters asian american lesbian main characters like it's mm -hmm. 
Good, it's good. It's a good. fantasy reimagining of The Great Gatsby, I believe. Right? So that's yeah. one of them. Mm -hmm. The Chosen and the Beautiful yes. is, a, is a queer magical retelling of Gatsby. But then there's a newer one, it's called Siren Queen, and it is set in pre-code Hollywood, and there's a Chinese-American lead um, who wants to break into movies in a time in which Hollywood is partly powered by fairy magic, and signing a bad studio contract means you might actually be literally signing away your soul to like an otherworldly being. Oh, really good. Amazing. Very queer. Very good. There's yeah. really good stuff out there. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> we should have like made a book list and passed it out to everyone. Because I'm like, okay, this sounds incredible. Um, uh, and then Mari, you. Um, there's this element in the Life on Earth series of maybe there's a girl who's from a different planet or who has been abducted by aliens. We don't know. It's kind of ambiguous. <laughs> it's funny because like I don't, I, until very recently I didn't read sci-fi or fantasy or anything. Like I still have read very little fantasy and I've only read a few, few sci-fi books. And like I feel like I'm just not in that world until somebody pointed that out that there are aliens in my book. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, but they're a metaphor. But then I guess that's always the case. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm only you know kind of realizing my identity as a sci-fi writer. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, you've written a whole sci-fi script. I I didn't know. <laughs> You were like, I was shocked. <laughs> I mean, I did recently write a book. I mean, it hasn't come out yet, but it's about time travel. And like, I guess yeah. that mm -hmm. counts. Yeah. 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 Time travel yeah. is definitely sci-fi. I don't know, but it just, it, it's just cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just interested in it. So I, didn't, I guess, you know, you have these concepts of what a genre is. Like, you know, romance is a genre that I hadn't read much of, except when I was like, 11 and like looking for all the dirty parts and <laughs> you know so but, but i haven't read much of but like a lot of you know i, I hate genres i hate labels like mm -hmm. i'm a typical gen xer i'm like, <laughs> anything i'm completely liminal you're like is that an alien in my book could be <laughs> a spaceship what who drew this <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of interesting though because like uh, listening to you talk I'm realizing oh like um, listening to you speak about genre I'm like oh these were the comics you know in the 40s like EC comics that were being burned were the genre comics the comics that were weird fantasy weird sci-fi horror comics so we keep the traditional comics the Comic Code Authority acts was romance and detective comics yep. and superheroes that were like very sanitized, clean, squeaky mm -hmm. clean. That's yeah. what was escaped the self censorship of the whole industry. Yeah. 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 So we're proudly keeping the tradition alive, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did. Oh, yeah. So, Mari, we talked a little bit about the style shifts in uh, the Life on Earth series, and you've touched on it briefly, but I just, I did want to show people kind of what that actually looked like oh, yeah. in the book. Um, and these pages are quite beautiful, so. Thank you. That, like, that visual voice, why did it feel appropriate to be shifting that visual voice for the story from character to character? Um. Well, I feel like um, to, to sorry for all the ums. I'm, I'm, I'm calculating in my brain. The the impetus for this storyline, which was told through different points of view and drawn in different styles, was because I was trying to put myself into the shoes of someone that I could not relate to. Um, God, they did it again. <laughs> it was a person who had betrayed me, and I just wanted to stick myself in her psyche. And see how she could have, how you could do something bad to some but someone you love, and so that's. And I wasn't ready to write about it in my more form yet. I just, I, but I really was craving that compassion for her because I'd been demonizing her for so long, and I just, I just wanted to get into her skin. And so that's how I came up with the storyline and the different points of view. As anybody who's written fiction will know, you can base it autobiographically and it's just going to go in a different direction. So it wasn't, it, it pretty quickly wasn't her anymore and it wasn't me anymore. And it was just the, these characters became themselves. Uh, and the, each, each one's visual language, I guess you would call it, that how they see the world was very based in 
Like for example, middle gal, Paula Navarro, she, um, she you, don't, you never see any panel borders for her. She's kind of a free spirit. She's kind of a mess. And so, you know, she's, her thoughts are always spilling out everywhere. And that's how I visually wanted to portray things. She's sort of, a, she's sort of scatterbrained, but, but very cerebral. Whereas uh, the guy to the right, his, his visual, visualization is very stylized. Like he just sees the world as like almost like he's the character of his own movie. Everything's very styly. Um, he does have grays, but they're, they're all very conformed to his way of thinking. Emily Baker, this is actually an unusual shot for her. She's uh, very, very black and white in how she thinks she, uh, or she thinks she's very black and white, but as the story continues and bad things or good things happen to her, we start introducing grays. And so the, that was sort of the, the, how it ended up for everybody. There's another character who's very artistic, very literary, and I completely did gray wash, like watercolors for him. Mm -hmm. It's super fun. Just, yeah. I mean, I, part of this is just an excuse for me to play with the medium and just play, like, how can I tell this story and make it as weird as possible? <laughs> like, oh, oh, no. Oh, nice. oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ah. Sorry. Experimental yeah. art <laughs> rules and <laughs> mics are, yeah. Oh, here we go, Maya. Oh, um, oh yeah, Maya. So I wanted to talk about, because, so Mari, you taught Maya at, is that, yes. like, oh, okay. I so, had very cool hair back then. <laughs> <laughs> and kind of encouraged Em to create, to write about air life, right? So, I was teaching a memoir class, yeah. so. Yeah. yeah, this was one of the, oh, now mine's going. No! <laughs> We're going to lose all of our mics. <laughs> this is, um, I went to California College of the Arts, which is in San Francisco, and I did their MFA in comics program there, and Mari was one of the very first teachers that I had, like, within the first week of classes, and I was with, uh, you did a great job. You did, it, was a, it was a great class. Um, we have different memories of how it went. Um, anyway, I was with a new cohort of classmates that I literally just met days before, um, rolling in with a medieval fantasy project that I'd been working on for a couple of years. No interest in writing memoir, very private. I'm actually an introvert. I don't know if that shows on stage. But, um, and Mari said, like, well, I, I mean, we're gonna write memoir, we're gonna write about our lives, and gave us this wonderful exercise, this from Linda Berry's syllabus, where you write about Oh, was it, was it there, not Brazilian? No. Oh, it was from my syllabus. Was it from your syllabus? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we also talked about Linda Berry in that class. I, I we read made Demons you read 100 Jane as one Demons. of the. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I had thought this was from syllabus. Okay. I've Again, never misremembering. I've read her. Uh, no, her teaching stuff. Okay. But, but continue. Um, anyway. <laughs> two memoirs. I know. It's memoirs. We don't know anything. We don't know. Anything. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. Is fallible. <laughs> anyway, an exercise. Um, we were prompted to write about our a list of our demons, or like I, I, I remember being described as like difficult subjects, or the kind of things that you like lay at, awake at night, like thinking about, like those deep topics. Or tell tell stories at parties. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I didn't go to parties at that time, so I. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so like I made this list and I was like, oh my God, every single one of these topics is about gender. And I was like, oh, I am not ready to write about that. Um, and it was really, really hard for me. It was the first memoir piece I had ever written in my life. And I was so uncomfortable with it. I was so tell. uncomfortable. <laughs> and I, I drew a short comic. I still have it. It is, I think you can really see my discomfort when you, it was, had this very like ironic tone to it. This very almost crude, like, cruel to my younger self kind of voice and I didn't do a very it's like it's very sketchy it's honestly quite sloppy and I disliked it so much you know that I taped over it in my sketchbook and didn't look at it again for three years three years three years and you um, include that scene here yeah. where it's like and, oh. <laughs> but I mean that I still consider that lesson like one of the most important classes I've ever taken in my entire education because it was prompting me towards something that at the time felt really uncomfortable and it, I wasn't ready to approach it yet, but it planted the seed. It planted the seed of it. And then I, in the intervening three years, met many more trans and non-binary people. I had another non-binary non professor, Melanie Gilman, 
who's local to this this part of the this part of Ohio right now, and I came out. I started using specific pronouns and all of this, and I was trying to like come out and be a bunch of conversations with people, and it just felt like I could never get my point across. And then another friend of mine, a cartoonist, Ashley Argillery, was like, "I think you maybe need to write about this," and that was like finally returning back to like this topic and this list and this like lesson that I'd had years before. Mm -hmm. And when I finally sat down to write about it, it just started like pouring out. So I really think it's just sort of like the time wasn't right, but the idea was planted, if you know what I mean. That's important. I yeah. just thought I was a terrible teacher. <laughs> it was my first time teaching and like everyone hated all the books I assigned. Oh, no. no one wanted to do the project. <laughs> I'm like, ah, I suck. <laughs> And yet, gender queer came out of and that gender class. Queer gender out. queer came out, and that's how Justin Hall convinced me to try teaching Here again. <laughs> He's like, look, look, Thank it actually you. ultimately went better than you thought it did. Yeah. Like, I like instant gratification. Oh. <laughs> that's why I do graphic oh, nice. novels. Yes, <laughs> yes the most oh, wow. instant gratification. <laughs> where you <laughs> don't take long to produce. Yes. They're very quick to. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to turn it over to audience questions in a moment, but um, I want to get, yeah. I, I want to ask kind of a big, broad question for my last question, which is mm. why do we need queer comics? Mm. They're just why do we need them they're now? They're just good. Yeah. Like, we need all the comics. Like, yeah. I feel like we want, I want every freaking person in the world to make an autobiographical comic that I can read personally. <laughs> you did ask me to make one earlier. <laughs> I mean, this is my goal. Like, I mean, I don't want everyone to be a cartoonist because cartooning is hard and horrible <laughs> and no one would eat or pay rent if that were the case. But I do want everyone to tell me their secrets because I'm endlessly fascinated about people and I, I want to know more about people. Every time I learn something new about something, it's, it's something new about people specifically, it just makes me want to live more. Mm -hmm. And you know, that, I mean, that's what life is all about, is connecting, is seeing new things. I, I just get so excited. And I think everyone has a story to tell, and especially if they don't think they do, they freaking do. Like every, everyone says they can't draw, I can't tell stories, but like, did anything ever happen to you? Like, tell me something funny. Did you ever fart in front of people and be embarrassed about it? Tell me that story. Like, I want to know that story. And like, queer stories are really good because like, you know, queer people are awesome. Yeah. <laughs> they're more interesting. I'm sorry, they're just more interesting. And it's not, I mean, it's, it's, it's because I think the people who are, um, I don't want to say marginalized, I feel like marginalized is, is a shitty word, but I'm just going to say marginalized. They've lived more interesting lives because they've had more struggles. Mm -hmm. um, so any kind of marginalization, like I feel like people who've had, you know, dis disabled people have such interesting stories because they've had to live in a ways that most people don't have to live. And, you know, people who grow up you know, on the outskirts of things, they have more interesting stories than people who are just accepted there. No one wants to hear a happy story. I mean. <laughs> I like a happy story every now and then. I mean, I want, I want them to be happy. I, want, I like happy people, but mm. like, I don't want to hear about how complacent you are. Uh. Like, you know, oh, today I had a good day, the end. Like, <laughs> tell me your story. I want to hear all this, but it's not like, I, but I want to hear those stories too. Mm. And, and I just think it'll bring us all together. Cause again, world peace, mm. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> used, used to pondering this one. Yeah, I'm just thinking about turning it over a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I I I love all comics, but I do especially I think love queer comics, and I think there is something what you said about specifically people who have seen less of their own experiences reflected in more pop culture mainstream media. Um, can't fall back on the same kind of stereotypes and these stories we've seen over and over again. Um, and, and so the story might, you have to sometimes even invent some new language to tell your story if you've never seen your story in, like in the mainstream before. And then I think comics are very good for, I will use that word also, marginalized authors, whether that is 
race or immigration status or just ability status or neurodivergent or queer or trans or non-binary, um, partly because in comics, especially if you were an author illustrator, you can draw yourself or your characters looking however you want. And especially if you're writing memoir, you can draw yourself how you see yourself, if, including if that is not how the world sees you. Yeah. And so I do think comics are a very powerful medium for people who are not like seen accurately by the world mm. um, because you can then present your own your own viewpoint kind of like what you did fictionally in your series it's like you can do that for yourself as the author mm. about any character any story yourself fictional character and so i do think that that is part of why comics are such a powerful medium and also like the bar to entry to, for comics is quite low <laughs> like the materials you need to draw them are so inexpensive like you can draw it with a ballpoint pen on copy paper and you can turn out a masterpiece I mean look at uh, you know my, my favorite thing is monsters yeah, and it's, yeah. Oh a ballpoint God. pen on line paper and um so beautiful. and also the comics community is so welcoming to self-publishing which is very not true of other industries including right. things like uh, prose novels and children's picture books and things like film and music are so much more expensive to produce. But I think in comics, you can create such a rich and full world out of just your imagination and one piece of paper and one drawing implement. And yeah, you can you can show a story that's really never been told before. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm st I was hoping to have an answer by the time you were done. <laughs> Thank you so much for stalling for me. I really appreciate your long answer for that reason. Um, okay, I had the seed of a thought, and we're going to work through this on stage, so please bear with me. Um, I'm also exhausted. It's been a very long weekend. So enriched and so tired at the same time. Um, uh, earlier this week, I gave a talk, and I described comics as a medium that's exceedingly accessible because it's a medium that strives not to leave anyone behind. I come from a family space that speaks a hybrid language because we wanted to make sure that we could stay abreast of each other's lives, even if there was a linguistic divide. And I used to bristle at the idea that comics would finally be accepted in the classrooms in order to get reluctant readers back into the habit of reading books. I hated it. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that getting back into the habit of reading is a good thing, and mm. comics are endlessly rereadable, and your relationship with it changes the more you read the same piece of work over and over. And so I got over that hump. And then I also realized that specifically with queer comics, it's really important, especially in a community where language shifts so dramatically and where language is also very, very important to be able to have this medium that is accessible beyond it. Mm -hmm. I think the impetus for The Magic Fish, where the primary tension is that there is no common language to discuss queerness between a child and his mother across different uh, cultures and languages, that has clumsy um, analogy, uh, um, analogies in, um, in queer communities because the ways that we describe ourselves are constantly changing. And so comics being a medium that helps kind of facilitate that distance across time and the ways that we express ourselves is something that's deeply powerful and that can connect us across generations in ways that prose and text alone can't. Mm -hmm. I think I got it. Yeah. Thank you. That <laughs> nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. All right. So I think we do have time for one or two questions. Um, I'm going to ask that if you do ask a question, if you could please keep it brief. Mm -hmm. um, just so that we can answer more of them, if possible. So. Do we have a mic that people are supposed yeah, to I, speak into? Is oh, that, Han has a mic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. there are two. They're on either side. And I can't the back. see Find the back, the so if people volunteers. are raising their hands back there, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> ah. Oh, hey, Lauren. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to take a picture of all you. <laughs> I'm just going to yell my question real loud. Okay. Okay, I'll repeat it. Hey. 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 Nope. Oh, oh hey. Okay. Uh, of taking the classroom of students who are like, I don't want to tell you my secrets. And being like, no, tell me all of them. Um, and so I, as a professor, had a diary comics assignment. 
<laughs> former student who just went, ha. Ah. <laughs> um, that I actually cut because mm -hmm. I had such a hard time convincing students that, yes, writing about your life every day, even when your life is maybe not exciting, mm -hmm. right? You don't have to write the Iliad and the Odyssey every day, mm -hmm. right? But that the idea that the mundane could be, uh, so my, my question is, how, do you con how did you convince them? Or for those of you who have written, you know, memoir, diary comics, stuff like that, that when you don't have something exciting, how do you still put pen to paper and say, this was my day? Mm. Is this a question for me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean. I mean, one thing I'll say, I'll, I'm gonna then address this specifically to the audience and anyone in the audience who feels like they maybe wanted to write memoir but aren't sure, and maybe they think, yeah, their life is not full of enough excitement. I genuinely worry that the genderqueer would flop because people would find it boring because there's been no external conflict in my life. Um, every because almost all of my conflict has been very internal, and I thought my life has been too easy to warrant a book. I just, like I legitimately that might sound like a joke, but especially because I signed the book deal at 28, and I was like, who wants to read the memoir of a 28 year old? Like nothing has happened to me. <laughs> like and in my like literally, I think before I wrote the book, if you'd asked me like. What have you done in your life? I would have said, I've read 3,000 fantasy novels and that's it. Like, that's literally <laughs> all I've done. And it was through the process of writing that I sort of uncovered the events of my own life and was able to put them into um, a narrative that I had, I was like, not even, didn't even know was there in some sense. And so um, I think that, like, sometimes it's the writing of it that, like, in, that reveals the story. I mean, I wasn't able to convince certain people, <laughs> um, but in workshops, I, you know, I do diary coming workshops quite frequently, and I just don't take no for an answer. Um, I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'll just sit down with a person and say, hey, well, what would you, you know, tell me something that happened to you this week. Everyone has something to say, and then you kind of guide them into telling them how to make it interesting, because <laughs> that's the thing about writing and storytelling. It's not the story, it's how you tell it. Mm. And the best writers will make you really interested in something that you weren't previously interested in. Mm. And not everyone is inherently a good writer, but everyone can be a good storyteller. It just takes practice. Yeah. yeah, I think the thing that I tend to tell people is like, first of all, there's a sense of preciousness that I need folks to get over when they're learning how to do something. And so I love to tell people to make really crappy art, like make it awful, make it disposable, make it something that you don't need to show anybody, which is not great if you're working on an assignment. Um, but for memoir stuff specifically, and this is the reverse of what I tell people, you know, how to operate on the internet. When you're on the internet and you don't have a sense of um, ownership, or if you don't have a strong sense of your identity being out there, you'll behave in ways that are totally inappropriate, and you control people and be anonymous, and your you know your behavioral levels are just like whatever. But if you're making a memoir comic, that can actually be fantastic. Draw yourself as something else. Draw yourself as a bunny. Draw yourself as some ridiculous bunny animal, and then be dramatic and be a huge diva and take little things and make them into something big and powerful. And it becomes this really freeing way of telling your own story while also being able to observe yourself in a way that could be amusing. And so it help depersonalizing the personal sometimes helps tell a better you know, diary comics sometimes, which is really weird. I would like to publicly ask Maya if they would like to share that comic that was underneath the piece of paper with us at some point. I would not like to. <laughs> to <laughs> this 240-page book. Do you accept this offering? It's, it's genuinely not good. Like I don't. Why I don't like it is because I am unkind to myself. Um. Okay. And also the drawings are, oh my god, sloppy. Oh. <laughs> but I, I mean, literally, I think yeah, like gender queer is the process of like how do I write this through the lens of compassion instead of the lens of irony. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Mm -hmm. I think we have someone down here. I'm like, he's come up. Yeah. Don't want to see it. 
I mean, I'll email it to you, okay. but I'm not going to post it online. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you might, I mean, it's all fun. Take your email. Um, <laughs> hi, this is a bit broad, but I would love to hear from each of you what you would say to young queer creators. Yeah, what would we say to young queer creators? Hmm. I want to steal something that I watched in an interview last night between Jeanette McCurdy and uh, Drew Barrymore, which is right like everyone you know is dead. Oh. Like, so like not worrying about the judgment of readers, kind of. Or mm. whether or not their books are going to get banned, mm. or yeah, what, mm. whatever is going to happen. Just, just, just yeah. write what you're, with your heart. I would say just like keep going, like don't give up. I, you know, I like no one starts out good at anything. We're all bad at it when we're beginners. Um, I and like I think any skill, including drawing, including writing, there, it's just like learning a language or learning an instrument. You have to put the hours in to get good at it, and just don't stop. Just keep going. Just keep making art. Mm, I think for me, um, my advice would be to not feel pressured to edify the public about your experience. Mm. Um, I think, you know, make work that interests you and that drives you forward just because you come from an identity that is not a part of the hegemony doesn't mean that you are tasked with some special responsibility mm. to make other people feel more cosmopolitan. Mm. You can just do the stuff that you want, make stuff that's really honest and really indulgent and serve yourself first. Mm. Also, I would like to ask every queer creator to join my database, queer creator, uh, queer yes. cartoonist.com. It's important for the archive. Yeah. Other questions? Like, okay, we've got hands over here. So many people have hands. We've got hands oh. down here. Oh, sorry. Wait, where was the hand up here? Hi, how's it going, everyone? Hello. Thank you. It was uh, really exciting to hear your story. And actually, while I was sitting here myself, I'm an artist, I actually felt it was really rejuvenating hearing some of your themes on interracial relationships, your own personal struggles, queerness, and being a marginalized body. Right now, I'm personally struggling with making work myself that talks about a bit of my story and a bit of my history, and even going further and talking about my family's history. And depersonalizing myself for my art is a real challenge that on some level I'm afraid of, but I can feel myself at the verge of this change that is really gonna change my life and I can see myself being a lot happier about the person I'm becoming. After each and every single one of your own personal work through your art, how did that change you as a person and who are you now that maybe you're a little bit happier about who you became and who you hope to become moving on? Mm. So how did writing about our own work change us? Yeah. God, I've been doing it for so long, I don't even know. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm yeah, more recently published, and I can say that, like, for me, writing Genderqueer was, like, the best decision I've maybe ever made in my entire life, and it, like, strengthened a lot of my relationships, including to my family, including to my friends. It helped me, the process of writing it was extremely useful in helping articulate what I was trying to say. I felt like I knew myself better after writing it, and then I was better able to be known by my communities. And it has also made me feel less alone in the world because so many readers have reached out and said they related to it. And every time someone says that, I'm like, cool, there's more people who feel how I feel. You know what I mean? So for me, it has been an, it's interesting. Like, despite, yes, the book bans, the media, the lawsuits, it has been an overwhelmingly positive experience. That is so beautiful. Like, I've, I'm, that makes me so happy. <laughs> I, I, I also experienced that um, in places that I really didn't ex express, expect to. Like, when I came out with Turning Japanese, which I thought was a very specific story that publishers were turning down because it wasn't universal enough. Like, a lot of people came up to me afterwards, and you know, at conventions especially, and said that they really related. And I'm like, to what? <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of it was like, this is the first time they saw a half Asian, like half Japanese person, like in a graphic memoir. I'm like, oh, oh yeah, I guess I really haven't seen that either. But like, it didn't really, you know, until people told me this, I just kind of didn't even realize that I was 
suddenly representing other people. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is interesting. Yeah, the, the act of creating and the act of getting feedback are just such completely different experiences that don't even feel related to one another, honestly. Yeah, and all of us have made really personal work. And I think for me, after making um, The Magic Fish, I became less afraid of myself, right? There are a whole bunch of things about the way that I navigated the world that I sort of avoided addressing just because I thought they would be too messy. Um, and in the instance of The Magic Fish, I really embraced the things that made me very angry. I didn't think of it as a terribly useful emotion, but in the process of telling a very long story about things that angered me as a child, I, I, you know, understood that anger is a good thing. Anger is the part of you that loves you, that says that you deserve more. And suddenly I felt like more of a whole person that I can access all of my feelings and that those things are the things that protect me. So, you know, making a work like this helps you know yourself better and helps you love yourself in all of your messiness. And I wasn't expecting that. Mm. <laughs> anger is wonderful because anger produces change. Mm. Mm -hmm. Hello. All right, I think, let's see. Is it on? Yes. Oh, it is, okay. Um, when writing fiction versus writing autobio, do you come at it with a different mindset or does that, is that line not even real? Like, mm. does it matter to have a different mindset or is everything just the same? It's so different. I mean, I was doing autobio for years and years and years and years. And when I did this Life on Earth series, which I started in 2009, and got published in 2019 or 18. Um, it was so different. It was so freeing. I didn't have to worry about what actually happened. I um, I didn't have to worry about so many things that um, that I had to worry about with autobio. I had to worry about other things like how do I make up an entire town? How do I make an entire person up? Like, you know, I can't just completely clone my friends. I have to, you know, give them their own personalities. Like, there's just such different challenges. And it was really exciting because, you know, you're using a different part of your imagination and brain. And, and also, there's very little trauma that you're drumming up. I mean, even if, when you're writing about traumatic events, like, you could make it really not about you and just take what you want and, you know, it was very, very freeing, but also it's very, very hard mm -hmm. in ways that autobio isn't. Um, and it, for example, like autobio, just it's inherently easier to make something feel authentic when it actually happened. So yeah, lots of pros and cons. Everyone should do both if, mm -hmm. if you like writing. It's, yeah. it's really fun and traumatic. <laughs> <laughs> I would also really encourage people to do both. And I, I feel like this, the similarities are like just needing to sit down and put the hours into your work and care about your craft and, and, and like be into what you're doing. But some of the differences are, for example, I sold genderqueer without a script because I was like, I'm not worried about not knowing how the story ends because I lived it. Whereas the next book that I'm working on is fictional and I felt the need to write a complete script and also thumbnail a draft before I could sell it because I was like, I need to be sure I know what happens in the story. <laughs> and also I need to like know how many pages it is. And like I have done so much more concept art and preparation work for my second book, which is fictional, because I, yeah, I couldn't just be like, the characters are me, my parents, my sibling, et cetera. I had to be like, okay, you have to develop this whole cast of characters that felt the need to destroy it. Um, you know, character designs and do location designs and just like a lot, a lot more work because I was making it up more from scratch. Um, so I felt like I had to like have a stronger proof of concept for the fictional work than for the memoir work. Yeah, the challenges are just slightly different because when you're, you know, when you're making a memoir work, you're working from memory and memory is imperfect. And then you also end up kind of telling other people's stories a little yeah. bit too. So there's some ethical negotiations that you have to do that is not quite the same for a work of fiction. And a work of fiction is super challenging because yeah, you do have to make everything up. <laughs> While I was thinking about this, I was like, man, compulsive liars sure have a really tough job because you know, <laughs> telling a fictional story is just like a really long lie, right? <laughs> and then you lose track of all of the lies that you've told. It's harder, so you have to keep notes. So they're, they're differently challenging, but they're they're both very enriching. <laughs> what is that, um, that, that program that they had? It's like a word processing program like Word, but it's for writers specifically? 
Scrivener, yes. So maybe compulsive liars all use Scrivener. <laughs> that was a lot of lead up to my joke. <laughs> Let the record show, Trung said those poor compulsive liars. <laughs> all right, I think we have time for one more question. So let's go down here. Oh. Or maybe two. Oh, I hope this is uh, specific enough that you can answer. But as someone that's kind of like dabbled with the idea of uh, doing like a memoir or just kind of like a sort of pseudo therapy session with yourself just to kind of like distill what you're, you live through. Um, how do you do that where you're not like putting everything that ever happened in your life out you know, on a paper to distill it in a narrative fashion uh, so that it is uh, legible uh, without being like, you know, it's 3,000 page or something. Um, and especially like, and you mentioned, um, memories aren't perfect. Uh, so um, memories that like you can't even perfectly remember, or, you know, don't really have memories of, there's not really any sort of artifact of that time period of you. Um, so I guess my question is like, how do you, uh, reach in those places that you haven't really uh, distilled? Um, it helps if you kept diaries your entire life. Um, <laughs> so go back in time, and yes. when you were like 10, start diary, writing journals for your whole life. No, um, it is hard. I mean, I, I am a journaler, so I did have a lot of what I call like primary source material of like the writings that I'd done as a young person, and I did reread all those, and that was really helpful. But even those were in incomplete and imperfect. Um, and I know, like for my memoir specifically, I was like, there is an overarching theme, which is gender and sexuality. And so I went through these diaries that I'd written, and I bullet pointed any memory that seemed to specifically to have to do with gender that seemed like it would be useful to the story, and I left out vast quantities of things. And that was because I, yeah, I didn't want to draw a 3,000 page book. Um, and it's that that is one of the hard parts then, is the picking and choosing, and there were some memories that I did draw a draft of that ended up getting cut because maybe my editor or I was just like, this is just not as impactful or it's not as important. So I, there's gonna be some editorial process and work probably. But you also mentioned like, how do you stop it from just being like a therapy session word vomit? And I think part of it, and maybe both of you can agree or disagree with this, is like you kind of have to have processed what you want to write about to a certain extent before you even start. So like it, it's often I think difficult to write the kind of memoir that's very reflective and um, like putting something into the context in which it happened about something that is very very fresh. Um, sometimes I think it does help to like write, I don't know, do you, do you agree with that or do you not agree with that? You know, up until very recently, that's what I was talking, okay. telling everyone to do, but my next book that comes out, I was actually writing it as I was processing the okay. catharsis or trying to. So um, there is no right way to do it. Yeah. Um, I do think my, my advice would just be to put it all down. And then like, and edit step laughter. Put away, step yeah. away. Well, I always do that. Like I always write just a ton. And I'm like, okay, I'll go back and edit it. But I actually never come back to the, the original stuff that I wrote down. Mm -hmm. It's like I have to get it out. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, okay, now that I've all done that, I, I'm just gonna start fresh. And like, I feel like just, just by getting it out, and I think it's like that 10 pages in the morning thing that people mm -hmm. do, I've never been able to do that. But like, where you're just writing like all the word vomit, like you're kind of clearing it out of your head. And then you're like, okay, now I can take a breath and, and see it. But yeah, a lot of it can just go, you know, go, a lot of it changes in the editorial process, and that doesn't, you don't need an editor for that. You could have yourself, you could join a, a writing group, is very helpful. I, I had a lot of writers groups before I had editors, and it was just nice to have a little feedback. Now you wanna make sure not to like follow everyone's advice, because they don't know what they're talking about, but helps to like hear what they have to say and see if you think that applies to you. Um, yeah, that is, it's really hard. That's the hardest thing about memoir is to figure out from a completely non-objective place what is important to the story and what isn't. And so there was like, there have been stories that I have taken decades to try to write. And then one day I realized, oh, that's the story arc. I, did, I thought that thing was completely unrelated, but that's what's, you know, you, you, you kind of have, sometimes do really have to take a step back and see, oh, that was the story. 
Otherwise, it's just an anecdote. But um, yes, and and but the great thing is with memoir, it's not like you can wait too long. It's not like you have to yeah. write it now. Um, yeah. In fact, you're pretty much guaranteed a better story the longer time, longer yeah. you wait. However, you do want to get it out on paper, like a draft. Something. Do you just write it down yeah. as you as you're thinking about it, and have something to come back to for when you feel like you're ready to write it, because that could be very valuable, especially as your brain starts turning into Swiss cheese when you're my age. <laughs> this seems like the perfect juncture to mention that Mari has a book that is currently on Crowdfunder, and it's yeah. a memoir, and everybody <laughs> should should check it out. And it's about a very complicated uh, friendship ending, and it sounds so juicy. And I know it's also a story that you thought about for like 20 years oh, before you started line. writing it. Yeah, that was what You should shout honor. out the title it's, uh, of I, this new one. I Thought You Loved Me. and um, yeah. I Thought You Loved Me by Mari is actually on Crowdfunder. Check it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mari is actually dressed as their book. Yeah, yeah, this is my book cover. I turned it into an outfit on print all over me. Um, and this is, I, I think, hydrangeas. A, a collage I made, which symbolizes memory in the book, and so I decided to create a outfit for my book tour, which was supposed to be happening around now, but then my publisher dropped me. But now I have a new publisher, and that's how we're funding the book. <laughs> Field Mouse Press. Yes. Thank you, Maya. You're <laughs> when the book actually comes out, I think you should put the title in sparkles on the back <laughs> of this. <laughs> I don't know what that's going to say to the world as I walk down the street, though. <laughs> like, I don't want everyone to love me. <laughs> Maybe just wear it at book events. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a likable character <laughs> in my memoirs. In real life, obviously, you love me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. If we did not get to your question, um, there's, there's a reception <laughs> where um, Mari, Maya, and Trung will be available to talk with you all. So um, I just want to thank you all again. This conversation was incredible. Um, and I just really appreciate you all sharing your time with us. So, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Bye. <laughs>